Hey everyone, Hillary here. Due to a combination of life things and poor planning on my part, there's no new interview this time around. But I'd like to take this spooky month to highlight a great episode from the backlog with our composer and true horror ghoul, Lillian Boyd. A few other things before we get to this episode. This show is now on Blue Sky at trunkcast.bsky.social. And I'm on there at hbbisniacs.bsky.social. Of all the Twitter replacements, Blue Sky seems to be the one where most of my writing friends have ended up, so it made the most sense that the show should find a home there, too. Also, a heads up that due to scheduling needs, next month's book tour with Murderbot author Martha Wells will be coming out on Monday, November 6th, rather than Friday the 3rd. Finally, thank you all so much for listening. I always appreciate hearing from fans of the show. Your support and enthusiasm really helps continue making this show what it is. And now, on with the episode. Warning. This episode contains quite a bit of strong language. Listener discretion is advised. Additionally, this episode's reading carries content warnings for pervasive gore, so if that's not your thing, skip forward about ten and a quarter minutes from the start of the reading, and you'll be out of it. Tales from the Trunk, reading the stories that didn't make it. I'm Hilary B. Bisniens. Listeners, I am just excited out of my mind to introduce an author, an editor, a podcaster, the composer of Paper Wings, the theme to Tales from the Trunk, Lillian Boyd. Lillian, <laughs> welcome to the show. Hi, Hilary. How are you doing? How's things? I, uh, it's been, it's been a time. You know, we are recording Mm -hmm. this uh, on the second to last day of February, and the world has been garbage for war refugees and trans folk and and trans people and like yeah, everything's everything's bursting into fucking flames, huh? Yeah, like it's just yeah, it's it's a lot happening. Honestly, like I don't um, anybody who's able to get like anything done during this period is a fucking superhero to me like i don't, I mean, I don't know how anybody yeah yeah it's it's yeah. it's incredible i i i can put out two episodes of podcast a month and like basically get my day job done and... Yeah, yeah. I mean, over over on Rank and Vile, um, Quincy and I, which of course, uh, for um, listeners who might not be aware, um, I do a little podcast called Rank and Vile with uh, my friend Quincy, and uh, it's so we. Great. Ha- Oh, go on then. Uh, we, uh, you know, we talk about horror movies. Um, we uh, have moved to like a, a twice per month format, just mm-hmm. because, like, yeah, there's there's too much going on all the time, and also Quincy has kids, which uh-huh. frequently means that like I've got children running around my house. I can't talk about uh, Tetsuo the Iron Man or whatever the fuck. So mm-hmm. it's yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, making making time to podcast very important. Very important. Yeah, uh, if if you uh, listeners, if you're interested in hearing me talk about horror movies, I was on a Patreon exclusive episode sometime in the distant past. I don't remember <laughs> during, when. During COVID, uh, yeah, but, we uh, it was uh, 28 days later, I think, right? Yeah, one of ah, my all time favorite horror movies, and like honestly, I think the best jump scare in zombie movie history. Oh, for sure. I think it has the best jump scare and also the best, like, oh, come on, kill, which is the guy who, like, gets a drop of blood in his eye from a bridge hundreds of feet above him. Like, that's, like, God specifically punched your ticket, my guy. (laughs) Like, this was was a laser-guided death um yeah but yeah yeah so you guys should uh, go check that out over on the rank of all patreon it was it, it, it it's a fucking great episode it's it was so it's, much fun to talk about with you was so much fun if you if you are into zombie movies watch 28 days later whether or not you've seen it before uh it's too bad that movie never got any sequels you know <laughs> yeah god you wonder what could have happened if you know 28 uh weeks later even could have happened uh-huh who Tragic. knows they only let alone the 28 months 
Ugh, yeah, yeah. You wonder what could have been. Uh, so, Lillian, you're going to be reading Inside Job. Is there anything we need to know before we get into the story? Oh, no, yeah. So uh, Inside Job um, is a... So it's a story that I started writing for... Um, there was this uh, anthology call for... Um, I think it was called, like, The Reinvented Detective, which was sort of, you know, they wanted detective stories that were kind of sci-fi or, you know, sort of mm-hmm. fantasy or horror adjacent. And the thing is that I'm, I'm like, noir trash from way back. Like, I, right. I'm... I'm a huge Raymond Chandler nut swinger. Like I, I, you know, I'm I'm so into noir, and like I, I grew up watching like Turner classic movies, and so anyway, so I, I did this um, story for that anthology. But the problem is that uh, I figured out while writing it that writing a short detective story is hard as fuck mm-hmm. because <laughs> you know you're you're trying to keep it under like four thousand or something, but you've got to set up. Uh, um, someone's got to die and then someone's got to, mm-hmm. you know, figure out what happened. And then by the end of it, you've got to come to some kind of resolution. And so I realized while writing it that like, this is going to be novella length by the time mm-hmm. I finish it. Um, and I, you know, like this is one of the stories that I really, uh, it's, it's a cyberpunk story. It's body horror. It's uh, neo-noir I, it, it's a lot it's a lot it's one of those stories that like even like while coming up with it i was like this is me being entirely ensconced in my bullshit um for stuff that for stuff that i like uh mm-hmm. and so yeah so it's uh yeah it's uh, it's all those things and uh yeah i really really love the story but I'm, I'm kind of like if i get this published eventually that would be great um but it's yeah it's gonna have to be a novella yeah like it's, it's right. a lot well ready when you are all right, I will I will take it from the top. <clears throat> what do you mean the tweaker exploded? I asked. <laughs> what I said, the haggard gas station attendant says, staring down at the half-acidly mopped tan tiles underneath my shoes. Blew up. All his insides came out of him, all over the floor and the snacks and everything. Ruined all them new stim jacks we got last week, too. The stim jacks, popular with local kids who need to plug into something that'd keep their adrenal glands humming hot enough for them to get through a 12-hour shift at whatever mega warehouse they'd managed to score work at that week, lays in a rancid bundle of boxes at the top of a big rubber trash can behind the counter. So we're talking spontaneous human combustion? Guy comes in last night, he's minding his own business, then he just blows like a cherry bomb? No, not like that. Slower. A slow explosion. I could see all them guts kind of pushing out from under that boy's shirt, like something was squeezing him slow, and then his guts came out, and it was too much guts. I'd figure any amount of guts was too much guts. (laughs) No, he says, leaning forward with a sharp creak that was either his spine or the ancient plastic counter. You ain't getting what I'm telling you. That boy had intestines that was coming out of his eyes, and kept coming and coming, and livers about like a dozen livers, coming out of his chest in a big fucking heap. There was hearts pushing their way out of him big ones, and they kept on getting bigger. He places his palms together and slowly, slowly spaces them apart, his watery blue eyes fixed on the tiles. I'd been hired by Tom Honeycutt, the CEO of Nashville Sponsor Corp, Garland Medical Holdings, to come down to the 24-hour quick go and see what I could see about the incident last night. Freelance investigators in this town usually get paid to investigate medical fraud, malpractice suits, bootleg body mod outfits. A steady hustle, but the kind that makes you give yourself paper cuts just to feel something. (laughs) <laughs> two grand in Garland's script to check out the mystery of the exploding tweaker is just fine. That's too much guts, I say. He wheezes like a hinge and turns away to wrap up the trash bag of viscerous lined stim jacks. How'd you know he was a tweaker? Had that look. Shook a lot. His eyes kept being funny, going the wrong way. He was outside for about an hour, just pacing and talking to himself. Crazy. Almost called city security on him, he said, lifting the garbage out of the can, grabbing a nearby bottle of lighter fluid and marching slowly around the counter to the door. <laughs> I followed. Sounds like a tweaker, I say in a voice I hope sounds friendly. You catch anything he was saying when he was out there? The attendant heaves the bag into the big burn barrel next to the dumpster. Any damaged or unsellable merch has to be torched to make sure nobody fishes it out and uses it anyway. City policy. Supposed to be here. She's supposed to be here. Kept on saying it. You see anybody else outside the quick go last night? Nobody but the customers, he says. He squirts a stream of lighter fluid into the burn barrel, lights a match, and the bag catches fire with a biblically vile stench. (laughs) Look, look, ma'am, he says, putting his body between me and the gas station. Not rudely, but not kindly, either. I gotta get back to work if you don't got any more questions for me. Yeah, I get that, I say. Thanks for all the help. He wheezes agreeably and plods back to his post. Sorry, one more thing, I call. He say anything else when he came inside? Before he blew up? 
<laughs> the attendant maintains his slow forward momentum, but turns his head a quarter to the side. Mallory. The tweaker, I discover at the coroner's office, is a 20-something kid named Jimmy Strock. Gracie, one of the attendants on duty, is always an easy bribe. We developed a pragmatic simpatico over the years from the number of times I'd come in needing to poke at the bodies of people who'd assumed room temperature. After a while, they'd bumped their usual admission fee from $100 in script down to 80 which means we're practically married by Gracie standards. <laughs> How'd they even get him down here, I ask? In five bags. There was a lot of him, Gracie says, popping their gum. They lead me into a walk-in refrigerator in the prep room where Jimmy Strock lies covered on a shelf. On the ground sits an enormous lidded tub labeled Strock, comma, J, parentheses, continued. Well, have fun. Be sure and lock the door behind you, Gracie says, and I give a little two-finger salute as they leave. I open my little leather case of tools, put on my thick rubber gloves, and tug the fabric off of Jimmy. You couldn't so much call it a body. It was a ruin of flesh and hair and fat and bone gnarled into a shape like someone had tried to draw a person using their feet. The places where the organs had emerged from Jimmy gaped in the frozen air, giving him a deflated look. I try to muffle my retching, fail, and then fail again. My stomach doesn't have anything to supply, and I'm glad I opted to work through my lunch break. Clenching my toes and sucking in a breath, I stick my little flashlight between my teeth and get to work scouring the husk of Jimmy, pulling him <clears> open <throat> and digging with picks and forceps. He's empty as a February sky. Satisfied that there aren't any surprises left in him, I bring up the signal reader on my small, compact, external smart box. Years ago, I'd tried to get an off-brand smart box installed in my left forearm, but my body had rejected it instantly, and I almost had to have the whole fucking thing amputated once the operating system shit the bed. My left hand never totally recovered from where the cheap thing's hookups fried my nerves. I have a contentious relationship with body mods. <laughs> the signal reader sniffs the cold air, looking for handshakes from any nearby tech. If Jimmy's body is in possession of any funny imports, the box will tell me about it. A sudden short chirp, questioning, followed by a longer chirp for confirmation. I dig through the signal reader's log for the source, which stutters in and out as I draw a big circle in the air with the box, trying to pin it down. Finally, the signal holds, and I realize that the signal isn't coming from anywhere in Jimmy's corpse. Oof. I pop the lid on the tub and follow the signal all the way to the bottom, pushing through fat, wet loops of brain and intestine until I fish it out a little bio patch about the size and shape of a band-aid. The box thumbs through the little thing's data stream, thinks about it, and spits it back out like it's choking on sharp little bones. It whines, warms up more quickly than anything should warm up, and crashes. So I'm going to have to wait a few minutes for the box to cool down and kick back on before I can get a good look at the bio patch and where it got coated. Hmm. Now just who the fuck are you? She stood in the doorway of the walk-in freezer, for the glare that brought the little room down another couple of degrees. She's dressed too nicely for this part of town, but all six foot five of her lessens the chances that anybody around here will be particularly inclined to try anything funny. <laughs> her oil black eyes flash in glittery little stutters. She'd had eye sharps installed, the pricey kind that can pick up the heat signature of every scrap of biotech in view. One eye locks onto me and the other regards the slime slicked bio patch dripping in one gloved hand. Her lip curls at both. I'm Abby Huff, I said, holding my palms up like I'm reassuring a bear. I'm an investigator. I Just collecting some info and then I'll be gone. Investigator for who? That'd be confidential information, ma'am. <laughs> In two quick strides, she stands over me, the flash of her eye sharps in the gloom of the freezer, making it look like I'm being mad-dogged by the goddamn northern lights. <laughs> she smells like sandalwood and vanilla and warm brass, and I want to bury my face in it, and not just because of how comprehensively it overpowers the rest of the room's offerings. <laughs> You know you ain't supposed to be here, she rumbles quietly. I could call city security and have them throw your bony little ass in jail for trespassing. You could, I say, but I don't think you'd get very far. Is that a fact? That's a fact. Security's not going to want to hold up what it is I'm doing. Not for the person I'm doing it for. Chief of security hired you to come down here and poke at a dead body? Confidential information, ma'am. <laughs> She seethes gently over me, her soft hands flexing as she contemplates crushing my skull like a styrofoam cup. <laughs> After approximately two decades, one eye sharp glances over at the mess that used to be Jimmy Strock, and all the poison drains out of her. She looks sad and tired. That's really him, huh? She says. That's Jimmy. Yeah, that's him. Shit. She gives up, trying to drive me like a nail through the freezer floor, and lifts a corner of the fabric covering the body far enough to get a good look. She recoils with a sharp cry. Fuck. Oh no. Oh Jesus, no. I briefly consider putting a consoling hand on her shoulder before nixing the idea on account of how far up I'd have to stretch. 
You must have known him. She doesn't quite laugh. We were engaged. We were going to get married in June. Oh, I'm sorry. Not your fault, she says. She puts her back to the freezer wall and shuts her eyes. Your, uh, your name wouldn't happen to be Mallory, would it? <laughs> her eyes stay closed, the eye sharps rippling beneath her smoky lids like tiny schools of fish. It is. Mallory Honeycutt. Fuck me, this is Tom's daughter. I don't know how much comfort this is going to be, I say, but according to the guy who was there when he died, the last thing he said was your name. Her eyes snap open. She stands rifle straight. My name? Yeah, he, he was thinking about you all the way to the end, I guess. Her expression is as unreadable as the info on the bio patch that had cooked my smart box. <laughs> the eyes sharp shimmer a harsh yellow that bounces off the stainless steel walls and makes me feel like I'm standing in traffic. A sound tries crawling out of her throat and dies in the attempt. Fucking Jimmy, she says finally, wiping her cheeks with her knuckles. He was sweet, but he was dumber than shit. I don't know what it was he got mixed up in, ending up like this, but I should have stopped it before he got himself too deep. I don't know that this is the kind of thing you plan for, I say. <laughs> the smart box coughs back to life and restarts with a series of sick sounding clicks. The biopatch info that the box had been able to commit to memory before it crashed is riddled with potholes, but I scroll until I manage to find the root file name. Signet med underscore regen underscore dev dot bio. Signet, the sponsor corp for Hopkinsville, Kentucky, and Garland's biggest rival in medical biotech. Whatever code had been inside Jimmy, it has Signet's brand on it, or at the very least a good imitation of it. Well, I say as I pocket the slimy bio patch and head for the door of the walk-in reefer, I'm gonna get out of your hair. Again, so sorry for your loss. Yeah, she says, eyes locked on the shelf that holds Jimmy. I'm sorry, too. Jesus. Yeah, so, uh, you, you know, it's a feel-good it's a feel -good story. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah it's it's a... uh, you're definitely on your bullshit the entire way through. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. I, is, uh, yeah. I've had a couple of other noirs on throughout the, throughout the life of this show, um, mm -hmm. and I... You know, it it is. It sounds extremely like white East Coast liberal of me to say <laughs> this, but like I have been a fan of noir since Guy Noir Private Eye on Prairie <laughs> oh, Home fuck. Companion. Oh fuck yeah! I feel like for me, like Guy Noir and uh, Nick Danger Private Eye. I don't know if you ever um, Fire Sign Theater, which it yeah. was always on. It, it was always on fucking PBS when I was a kid. Um, and yeah, I feel like. The thing about it is I realized um, – now, there's that thing when you start out as a writer where I think you're, you're kind of trying to – you know, you've got a lot of people that you're into that you kind of um, – it's like when a kid, like, clumps around in his, like, mo mom's shoes or whatever and, like, I, I'm an adult. Um, mm -hmm. and, I think, and I think we all kind of do that with the, the authors we really like. And I think when I started out writing um, horror especially, I was, like – I, I was and am obsessed with Clive Barker, uh, and mm -hmm. so, of course, I always wanted to sort of do these, like, long, lush, you know, sort of beautiful, you know, descriptions. And then I realized that, like, it, it's kind of pig and lipstick when I try doing that. Um, <laughs> and I, I think I came to a place of just, like, pretty much all I want to write is pulp. Mm -hmm. Like, that's, that's, the, that's the stuff that I actually enjoy writing because I'm able to get out of my head and I'm like, okay, what would be a funny way to put this? Um, mm -hmm. And, yeah, I think... Um, I, I feel like pulp is making such a huge like mark right now, especially on genre fiction. Um, mm -hmm. There's there's such a fucking appetite for it. Like I love that I can read so much. I don't know. Um, did you see um, Nightmare Alley? I don't think so. Holy shit! Um, it's the it's uh, Guillermo del Toro's new uh, movie. Um, okay. And it's neo yeah, yeah, and it's neo noir as fuck. And I just. I love so much in now, and you sort of wonder like hard boiled detective fiction is basically you've got a narrator who is able to remain kind of stoic during all of this stuff, and I realize like mm -hmm. I want more I want more hard boiled fiction that just has like the worst possible things in the world happening and then <laughs> waiting to see if the narrator actually goes like, Ah, Jesus, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> Like it's hard to stay hard boiled when somebody's organs are popping out of their body. But mm -hmm. yeah, I was gonna say, uh, like the the way that uh, Sarah Gailey's Magic for Liars starts out. Oh yeah, is trying to be extremely hard boiled, and the ability to stay detached vanishes. 
for yeah. spoiler reasons. Lots and lots of them. Well, and and you know, obviously, I'm uh, biased because you know, I'm <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of fond of Sarah Gailey. Yeah, um, a little bit, but. Honestly, like one of the things that I love so much about Ivy Gamble as a character, um, and it's so funny because especially like when I start, you know, when when I started um, dating Sarah, I went like a whole year without reading anything that they, without reading any of their fiction because mm -hmm. I was so nervous about like I didn't want to sort of come across as like, you know, a, a weird little fan or something because yeah. I was like, no, no, just you know, I'm I'm into you not because you write, you know, all this, and and mm -hmm. so eventually, and you know, they they sort of point out like actually. It hurts my feelings. Read my shit, motherfucker. And I yeah. did. It was like, oh yeah, you write like a fucking angel. Obviously, like I knew, I knew they were a great writer. But, um, but anyway, one of the things that I love about Ivy Gamble is that you know it sort of deconstructs the idea of being a hard boiled um, private eye because um, her drinking, especially as the novel increases, because it's so ubiquitous in noir mm -hmm. that like, oh, you know, they're taking a slug from a bottle perennially, um, and then it's like, no, that progresses throughout the novel. And then it gets worse, and she just keeps drinking and drinking and drinking. And yeah. you, you, and I, I love that it deconstructs that, because by the end, there has to be kind of a reckoning with that. Because you think of, like, you know, uh, you know Dashiell Hammett. Like, if you've got, like, Nick and Nora, mm -hmm. if, you read, if you read those fucking Nick and Nora novels, they're having, like, breakfast martinis. Like, they are just blotto 24 over 7. And so I love... It's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. And so anything that kind of deconstructs that, it's like, you can't drink, like, Humphrey Bogart. You'll die. Don't do that. Yeah. Like, yeah, completely. Yeah. And that, like, that that's the same, like, the same thing you were talking about a second ago of, like, pulp is having such an effect in genre and in the ways that, like, you know... It, it, I mean, it feels like, you know, a new generation sort of is getting to rediscover pulp and... Mm -hmm. You know, the the same way that our generation of writers is playing with every other damn thing. It's like, oh, okay, yeah. I'm going to, I like this, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to not dissect it mercilessly. Completely. Well, and, and that's also kind of the thing is like, I mean, I love Raymond Chandler, but like the racial aspects of certain, you know, stuff that, you know, he's done, like in Farewell, Farewell My Lovely. I mean, he's playing he's playing it pretty hot and loose with uh, some of the fucking terminology in that, and also it was mm -hmm. you know written you know early you know twentieth century, and so I think. Uh, and now I'm I'm an H.P. Lovecraft disrespecter from way back. Um, uh -huh. I, I, I think it's smart and good to do, and we should all we should all do it. Like I mean, obviously, yeah, fuck like that I, dude. Yeah, fuck that guy. Like I'm into I'm you know cosmic horror is great, but you kind of can't divorce like him being a weird little xenophobe from how mm -hmm. that influences fear of the unknown. Um, and I think if you're going to do noir, I mean, yeah, there has to be a level of deconstruction. Or what's also fun is to not deconstruct it, play it straight, and be as fucking splashy and ridiculous as possible. And I, I think um, with Inside Job, um, I mostly, uh, so much of, I'm realizing, you know, because I'm trying, you know, doing doing it as cyberpunk, um, it's impossible to do cyberpunk without talking about corporations and how they own fucking everything and i love the mm -hmm. idea of like every city is kind of its own city state that's owned by a corporation and they pay you in company scrip and it's mm -hmm. not you know applicable in the next town over and was wondering like yeah so like what would a private eye in a cyber and, and you know cyberpunk especially i feel like has always kind of played footsie with noir you mm -hmm. know yeah i mean like literally from the birth of the genre like mm -hmm. you can't say that like fucking neuromancer isn't a noir book completely i mean fucking blade runner even like yeah. that's so i mean so much of that you know especially in the uh, uh the theatrical cut where you've got harrison ford kind of doing his best philip marlowe oh yeah yeah uh, yeah, the the narration over the top of it that he you could tell that even he sounds like he's like zanned out for most of it. <laughs> like yeah. it's Harrison Ford bored in an armchair, just like all right, I guess I'll get through this fucking movie. But <laughs> yeah, I I think noir makes sense to me with cyberpunk because noir and cyberpunk are both interested in digging into why people commit crime and like why people mm -hmm. operate outside of the system in the way that they do. Because especially with noir, I mean you know, with prohibition, with, you know, morality laws, with so much stuff that was going on, it was like, okay, people are, people love doing crime. Mm -hmm. uh, people are big fans of doing crime and always have been. And and cyberpunk is such a big part of that too, where it's like, wow, we've got technology beyond what any of us have, have ever imagined. 
we don't have any more problems, right? <laughs> now that we now that we want for nothing, and it's like we're gonna find no, new. No, and... we've got a a lot of problems. Yeah, yeah, and there are new and exciting ways to f- crimes. <laughs> yeah, you can fuck each other over in so many ways, and there's neon now, so mm-hmm. it's well, it's it's well lit. Um, but yeah, I mean, like it makes total sense to me that noir and cyberpunk have like a natural simpatico. Yeah, I, uh, I wanted to circle back to something that you said before the reading about how, you know, you were writing this and realizing like, oh, I can't actually do this in. 4,000 words like that's Mm -hmm. ridiculous uh I've talked a little bit about the first story I ever tried to sell on here uh which will never see the light of day again but Mm -hmm. uh (laughs) that I so it's an urban fantasy slash noir story but I didn't know what urban fantasy was when I wrote it because (laughs) this was like 2005 2006 Oh, the Wild West of paranormal fiction. God damn. Yeah. And so I, you know, it is it is this uh man pain detective story with, mm. you know, werewolves and like high body count and like you know, uh I'm, in, I'm into all that. That's great. Fucky uh at this mirror that is the picture of Dorian Gray, only it takes on your injuries. Oh, nice. Uh, like, I, I love so much about it, I will never be able to, like, actually sell this thing. <laughs> oh, certainly not in the, in the form it's in. Like, mm-hmm. you know, maybe chop it up and, and Frankenstein it into something new. But oh, yeah. I wrote this thing and, you know, it came out at, like... I think the first draft I tried to sell was like seven hundred and uh, seven thousand six hundred words or something like that, and like oh yeah, you know, I mean that again, like two thousand and five fucking punk ass teenager who thinks that they're just going to be an overnight sensation. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's I feel like especially at that time, like you 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 know you're you're hopped up on books already, and you're kind of. You know, you've got the idea. What it is, I, th- I feel like that period is kind of like, um, you know, when you've got a kid who has watched a lot of music videos and they've watched a lot of guitar players doing like the weedly weedly, mm-hmm. you know, sort of sort of finger motions. And then they get on a guitar for the first time and they're like, I've, you know, l- hey, I've watched the video for Panama by Van Halen like a million <laughs> fucking times. I bet I can play. And then it's just like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I feel like that's. That's like that's like a lot of us starting out where, you know, we've got kind of a head full of books that we've already read and we're like, I bet I can do some permutation of that. And then you're able to, but it's sort of yeah, yeah, it is what it is mm-hmm. at the time. And I think I think I think it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know, like that that first draft was also you know, you're you're talking about like you have a head full of Raymond Chandler. I had a head full of Terry Pratchett, and so it was just oh, like yeah. let me do witty footnotes as well. And <laughs> you know this and that and the and like uh, i mean it's such a mess i mean I, honestly terry pratchett's footnotes and good omens are like the best part of that book to me like the yes. best book neil the best book neil gaiman ever wrote terry pratchett wrote half of it yeah like yeah, yeah yeah i think honestly with with footnotes especially it's uh you you kind of have to know what you're like you really have to know your onions to do like the clever footnotes like Mm-hmm. I, I never, I didn't get into Terry Pratchett until college, and the way that guy fucking wrote is always so incredible to me, because it's sort of like a joke you don't realize you're being told until the punchline hits so much uh-huh. It's just, it's so goddamn neat. Like, I really, really love the way that guy wrote. I, uh, I won't say I grew up on Terry Pratchett, because I don't think I got into, like, my dad tried getting me into Pratchett in sixth grade not with Discworld but with the Bromeliad oh, yeah. uh, and which you know I, I read right after graduating high school for the first time and I was like oh I adore this now mm-hmm. but you know at, at the time like he was just like here's this book by this author I really love you should read it and I got like a chapter in and just kind of bounced off of it and then like I don't know mm-hmm. six months later or something uh, about a year later, I guess, I heard, uh, or he, like, read to me the, like, scene out of Hogfather where Nobby goes to arrest 
the mall Santa and instead mm-hmm. gets taken on mall Santa's knee and given a brand new crossbow. And I just like, you know, that mm-hmm. was the shit that I needed. And I just sort of like started reading, you know, all of the Discworld adult novels in completely no sequence whatsoever. Yeah. And I mean, then like, genre-wise, fell back into yeah. everything. Like, I feel like genre wise, like Terry Pratchett is so, I mean, it's funny if you, you know, if you compare like, for example, Terry Pratchett and Raymond Chandler, um, for, for purposes of like plotting, I feel like a thing that I really love about, uh, Raymond Chandler, who is himself like, you know, he permanently on his bullshit. And it's funny because like mm-hmm. when he started out writing, you know, that guy had such a chip on his shoulder about writing this crime fiction shit because, mm-hmm. you know, like he was, you know, like educated in England. Like he was a, he was a proper, proper fancy guy. Uh, and yeah. what's incredible about so much of his, his crime fiction is he is, zero percent concerned about the answer to the mystery he's setting up he does not give a shit like there was Mm -hmm. one i i I think it might have i think it was um the long goodbye where someone asked him like so wait so who actually did it and he's like how the hell should i know like (laughs) raymond chandler is entirely interested in um writing you know cool like fun turns of phrase and, Mm -hmm. and just constructing that he's interested in characters side note philip marlowe is so queer that guy is so, so queer. So fucking gay. I don't think, I don't know if Raymond Chandler knew that, like, the way that he describes <laughs> men in his writing is so, like, you know, he'll talk about women as, like, uh, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll do a thing like, oh, you know, like, she was a blonde to make a bishop kick a hole through a stained glass window or whatever, and you're like, <laughs> okay, that's great. But then yeah. the way he talks about men is just very, like, he had soft eyes and just a beautiful voice, and I just, you know, found myself feeling really comfortable when he would, you know, <laughs> and, and it's just, like, the way that he's talking about it, it's just, like, I don't know. Raymond Chandler liked cats way too much to be straight. Is mm-hmm. the thing. Are you familiar with his thing with his cats? Yeah. 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 Like like writing letters to neighborhood cats as his cat Taki, like he anyway, I'm I'm yeah. All the all this to say, like, I I feel compared with Terry Pratchett, I feel like Terry Pratchett is so interested in the big picture of the novel and hammering home a point. It's like mm-hmm. I, I feel like I feel like every novel that I've read from him, I, I the, the ones that I've read are Guards, Guards, and uh, Vampire Suck, and mm-hmm. I feel and I feel like he starts from a place of wanting to say something and then managing to talk about characters and 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 I don't know he's so obsessed with character in a way that I I could I could never write the way that guy writes he's so mm-hmm. good. yeah I oh I mean I could like. Honestly, I don't need another podcast, but I could <laughs> start a Terry Pratchett fan cast. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. If my dad had technology, doing a Terry Pratchett fan cast with my dad would be like amazing, but oh, that's he what, does that's not what technology. <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, well, and it's funny, especially with dads, like Terry Pratchett, I think of as being a dad-shaped being. Mm-hmm. You know, like, like, it's hard for me to picture like a, like a young, you know, sort of virile Terry Pratchett. I know? have seen pictures of young Terry Pratchett and I, it, it does not translate. Like young Neil Gaiman makes absolute sense. Like oh, fucking yeah. little, the cure goth twink. He looks like a pile Neil of laundry Gaiman. that's undergoing puberty. Like yeah. he's, you, he, he has sort of knobbly fucking Ichabod crane ass limbs. Yeah. And then Terry Pratchett is just like, it feels unholy looking at young Terry Pratchett. <laughs> like there's something there that's just like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not supposed to be looking at this. Yeah. Yeah. Th- this isn't allowed. <laughs> who, who said that this was okay? Like that, that's dad shape. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's forbidden. It's like, it's like seeing like photos of like young Michael Caine or something. Um, but don't which, believe by the way, that. To, to, total smoke show, by the way, young, young. I mean, any Michael. I mean, he could. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, I need to dig into more Terry Pratchett. Like, I, it's. I think with Discworld especially, like, there's so much of it that it's so mm-hmm. intimidating because I'm like, where the where the where the shit do I do I dive into this? Like, there's. Look, I will offline. I will give you like your definitive <laughs> reading list. Very uh, good. excellent. I I I like. You know, like I said, I jumped around. I started out with Hogfather, which is one of, I think, one of the best of his, like, pre, I am just going to be political books. Mm -hmm. Like, his later stuff is so angry underneath the surface. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, like, that rage is there. 
already in by the time you get to Hogfather, but Hogfather, it is so approachable in the way because it, it's just a Christmas story is mm-hmm. what it bills itself as. And it ends up being about so many things. And I mean, any book with death mm-hmm. in it is amazing, but uh, like, of course, you know, yeah. I, I read from there and then I went back and read the first two books, which are just like, Fawford and the Grey Mouser are explicitly in the first book. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, here is some sword and sorcery bullshit. I'm going to make fun of it. Like, mm-hmm. let's do a Lovecraft pastiche in this chapter. Like, all that yeah. shit. Uh, well, well, it's also incredible to contrast with uh, Neil Gaiman's conception of death, which is like, what if death but goth GF? Uh-huh. Uh, like, in, in, in Sad Men. Um, which, you know, honestly... I, I don't I don't hate I haven't seen that um I I know that they um have they done the Sandman TV show yet? I know that they I honestly they have, it? I don't think so. I think it's in like the pre production purgatory still. I'm I'm gonna keep it one hundred with you. I'm so I'm not the world's biggest Neil Gaiman fan now. I think I, I I was in college. Um my favorite thing that Neil Gaiman ever did. Have you seen the episode of The Simpsons that Neil Gaiman was on? Yes. Where yeah, where it's like the I Italian job, that. and yeah, where, where they're like, okay, we're gonna assemble a crack team to write a fantasy novel, and you've got Neil Gaiman voicing himself. Um, I think that's my favorite thing that Neil Gaiman has ever done is doing the line delivery uh, of American accent cheeseburger and French fries. I'm yeah. all over it, pal. Like it's yeah. So if I may offer one alternative to the best thing Neil Gaiman has ever done, did you see the episode of the PBS show Arthur? That had Neil Gaiman on it. Uh, <laughs> are you fucking with me right now? No. It is <laughs> Wow. Okay. Neil Gaiman is a cat in Arthur in one episode. <laughs> and uh fuck, it, fuck me. That's incredible. It contains possibly the greatest line in television, which I I had as like my yearbook quote from college because this nice. episode came out in like 2010 i think which mm. is neil gaiman what are you doing in my falafel <laughs> <laughs> which is what you would say to neil gaiman if you found neil gaiman in your falafel like yeah this is, absolutely yeah ver- verite holy shit uh yeah i gotta i gotta check this out like it's yeah, incredible I, I will uh hopefully i can find a clip and uh put that in the show notes if not there will be some reference. There's got to be some way to watch this. Like, oh, very. You good. know, I yeah. I I buffered it all day on our shitty college internet, and like mm-hmm. came home in the afternoon and and like was like fuck homework. I'm going to watch Neil Gaiman on PBS's Arthur. <laughs> Holy shit! Yeah, yeah. I, I I feel like that probably took like zero convincing to get Neil Gaiman to to sign no, on for I, I this. No, I think he like... was absolutely like yes. I was waiting I, for you to ask me. I, yeah, I've been waiting by, I've been pining away, just waiting by the phone for this. I, I feel like Neil Gaiman, it's like, you've got to say the whole thing every time. Like you can never just call him Neil. Like it's, he's, no. he's, he's, he's Neil Gaiman. For some reason, the only also that person who is allowed to call him Neil is, uh, shit. No, it's not Alanis Morissette. Who's his Amanda musician Palmer. friend. Oh, is, is it Amanda? Oh, uh, Tori, uh, Tori Amos. Tori Amos. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was gonna say I don't know if Amanda Palmer's calling him anything anymore. <laughs> I don't. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a whole thing. But, but boy, what a uh, time to have been on the internet, by the way. Yeah, no, Tori Amos. I I feel like Tori Amos. Uh, growing up, you were either a Fiona Apple gay or a Tori Amos gay, mm-hmm. and I was definitely a Tori Amos gay. Like I remember. Same. Well, and it's funny because like growing up evangelical, I remember just hearing um, "Silent All These Years" on alternative radio, and just the <laughs> phrase uh, "I got the Antichrist in the kitchen yelling at me again," and I'm just like, "Oh, that'd be bad. You don't want the Antichrist in the kitchen." <laughs> gotcha. I'm like seven years old, like, "Whoa, no." Um, but yeah, so yeah, um, be, uh, uh, going off of that just for a tangent because I have to. Have you listened to? The uh, Neil, Neil Gaiman tribute album, uh, I think it's Where Is Neil Anyway, that's no. got, like, uh, it's got Tori Amos on it. Uh, the Crew Shadows do a, uh, like, Sandman song. 
There's is it, uh, is it mis- a is mirror it, mask it, song in there. Is it Mr. Sandman? Does Crook Shadows do Mr. 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 Sandman? <laughs> or, or Enter Sandman? Fuck! There's so many like there are I, so many you know, Sandmen. So many Sandmen, too many. I honestly, Crook Shadows. I love them because I feel like every compilation goth CD I got as a teenager had the Crook Shadows just like hanging out. I wouldn't be surprised if they never actually had a standalone album, and it was always just like, <laughs> "Hey, uh, we're we're putting together a goth compilation for Hot Topic called Dancing on Your Grave. You, you got anything?" And then being like, "I could cover Cry Little Sister from the Lost Boys soundtrack." And like, they're yeah, they're 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 who you want. I think the Crook Shadows. They are who you want, mm-hmm. and also put on an incredible live show oh yeah yeah i i think honestly um there was a uh, i think the goth concert i remember the most was uh, i think it was like 2008 and i uh saw voltaire and ego likeness uh yes. in, in, at the at the goth club in nashville um and i feel like voltaire he was in a movie uh, i don't know if we, we just did it for rank and vile uh, the velocipaster um, oh my yes yes yeah i remember velocipaster yeah, he just pop- Voltaire just fucking pops up like the toasty guy from Mortal Kombat fucking halfway through that movie, just like, hey, it's me, I'm gonna do an exorcism, and it's just like, what the shit? Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't honestly like being an aging goth. I feel like largely means you know, well, okay, is goth, goth, and punk. There's always that's the problem is when you, you, those two things. What it is is that you listen to Susie Sue and the Banshees and try to feel okay about like mm-hmm. having, having those things. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Like, also, goth and noir. I mean, makes makes total sense to me. But I think it's yeah. that um, private detectives. I feel like necessarily have to lead kind of a goth lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Like this is you're you're in a lot of you know uh, uh, heavily draped rooms. You're finding out all kinds of secrets. You're yeah. you know you're kind of pessimistic about the human experience. Oh shit. Um, um, what was that fucking za- vampire movie from like? 2008 2009 uh daybreakers oh, i never saw that oh i literally i feel like i dreamed of that movie but it has uh the like one standout piece of its soundtrack was that i believe that's where placebo's cover of running up the hill comes oh, from by, by, by kate bush yeah and yeah. like, if you ever want to get emotionally compromised by a cover song, oh yeah, I mean placebo. I feel like they've had my heart since Velvet Goldmine doing Twentieth Century Boy by T Rex. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Honestly, I feel like um, vampire movies, especially post. You know what it is? Uh, you know how Walk Hard: The Dewey Cox Story kind of nuked um, every rock star biopic for like mm-hmm. a decade because nobody could make another biopic now. Um, yeah. I feel like Queen of the Damned did that to vampire movies up until yeah. like, Twilight. Like that movie fucking happened, and it's like, oh, the voice of Jonathan Davis is so beautiful. It brought a, <laughs> you know the Queen of the Vampires back from the tomb. Um, and I feel like that movie happened, and everybody went like, oh, are vampires bad actually? Um, and then yeah, Twilight happened, which is also funny because we've been um, watching all of the Twilight movies because Sarah has been um, talking about them with uh, mm-hmm. their buddy, their buddy Maggie, and. For, on for a podcast uh, and... the excellent podcast failure to adapt yeah it's fucking great um but like watching those movies and it's funny because at the time with twilight of course i was very like you know uh, it was, real vampires don't glitter and it's like oh yeah. real vampires you mean vampires that exist in real life they don't fucking glitter you clown uh-huh. um and and like obviously those books are f- fucking god awful, but I feel like I'm so fond of them now. Watching the, mm-hmm. I mean, like I would never, I, I would never read them now, but watching the movies is amazing because of what a goddamn mess so much of them are. I know. It's great to watch with people. Uh, the, the Twilight movies can't recommend. Also, that baseball sequence in the first one fucking rips. That's just... it's incredible. That's like the only piece of a Twilight movie I've ever seen. <laughs> That's all you need. The fucking vampire baseball scene and then, you know, you're fine. You don't you don't yeah. need anything else. But, it's, yeah. I I feel like yeah, we had Queen of the Damned and then there was Daybreakers. There were a couple of other like mid 2000s zombie movies. Obviously, we had mm-hmm. the the Underworld sequence. Oh, oh. Which the like, sequence. Yeah, yeah. Completely. Yeah. Holy shit. Oh I mean, God, vampires movies. are not good actually. And <laughs> I mean, we we love those movies, and you, and like, 
oh, I can't remember when Blade 3 came out. I feel like that was pre-Queen of the Damned, but... Oh, yeah. Blade 3, all I remember is uh, professional wrestler Triple H holding a vampire Pomeranian. Yes! That's, that's that's the primary thing I remember from Blade 3, Trinity. Yeah. Incredible. <sighs> what a terrible time to be alive. The mid-2000s, <laughs> the early and mid-2000s, just like canonically the worst fucking time period, I think, to be consuming pop. Also, culture. House of Wax! <laughs> Man, I kind of stand that House of Wax movie. Like, it's it's garbage, but it's so much the thing it is. Also, <laughs> you know, Paris Hilton is a fucking champ for just being like, yeah, you can kill me in House of Wax. I don't give a shit. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, yeah. No, I'm I'm uh I'm listening to a lot of wax-based horror right now in... uh, (laughs) It's very specific. Which is, like, such a wild thing to say, but... Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, I'm I'm really consuming a lot of wax-based material right now. It it is... Wax and train horror is what's happening in... uh, So there's this actual play podcast, Friends at the Table, and they do, like, seasons of... You know, they've done their fantasy season and a sci-fi season and some more. And mm-hmm. then this most recent season is gothic horror. It's got uh, wear train. It's got wax-based uh, vampires. It's got... Uh, Fantastic. It's... If you like weird horror and actual play podcasts, absolutely do recommend. Oh, Friends at the uh, Table. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's incredible. Yeah. And yeah. like, you know, fucking goat people and uh, <laughs> a, a loosely organized mafia who goes around hunting the sentient trains who might take you where you want to be or they might just like eat you. Man, see, you, I, that, that's the thing is you, you, you mentioned uh, goats and then the mafia. And then I'm like, oh, you don't want to mess with the goat mafia. Like those yeah. guys, they're, fu- they're fucking crazy. Like they, no. you know... G- yeah, I, it's funny with goats, especially. Like, I used to sort of wonder, like, but I mean, goats are so cute. Like, why, why, why do Christians like? Why do why why is that a thing with like? Oh, the goats are evil. But then you you're around a goat for like five minutes, and you're like, you are the fucking devil, my guy. Uh. Like, apparently, on um, the side of uh, the witch or the the vivitch, um, the vitch. apparently, yeah, yeah, the the vivitch, uh, the the goat who played Black Philip apparently was a son of a bitch. Who, <laughs> Um, it's funny because like all the actors in interviews, like they, they talk about that goat and then their faces get real fucking stony and they're just like, I, that was the most unprofessional fucking goat I've ever worked with. Like he almost impaled, um, the guy who plays the father in the Vivitch. Like I respect, I I, I respect goats sort of constitutionally. Like they, they've got their own business and it's not on us to understand it. Yeah. Some good shit. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh. I feel like we've just been having, uh, like, you know, behind the scenes rank and vile at this point for the last, <laughs> like, half an hour. I am uh-huh. 100% here for just, like, the the reason I wanted to have you on this show and have wanted to have you on this show since I started it pretty much was, like, <laughs> listen, I feel like we can be on our bullshit indefinitely oh, yeah. Oh, on yeah, audio yeah. and, like, I... I would love for people to listen to this show. I would love for people to nominate it for awards. At the end of the <laughs> day, I would love to just, like, be a fucking little trash gremlin and talk about <laughs> gremlin shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's that's entirely why I do Rank and Vile, honestly. Like, the, the fact that we get it down on wax is, is nice, and I love the community, but it, it's it, so much of it is just, like, I like talking with my friend Quincy about goblin shit. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, entirely. Um, I mean, you know, you start out most episodes with, like, what ghoul shit have you been on? And, like, mm-hmm. if that's not an energy to bring into something, I don't know what is. Yeah, yeah, just straight ghoul shit. Like, that's that's primarily what I'm... And, and it's only gotten worse during the pandemic, especially. Yeah. Like, it's just, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a real it's a real problem. It's a, it's, it's a whole thing. It's great. Mm. Would mm-hmm. recommend. A plus. <laughs> 10 out of 10. <laughs> yeah, uh, totally. I just had this weird like weird sound in this police box just showed up in my room the podcasting room where i podcast and i'm wondering you know if we can step into this time machine <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, yeah i have started i have been 
yesterday was three years to the day since I recorded the first episode of this show to go live, mm -hmm. which was with Sarah. And, like, it mm -hmm. has been, since I started the show, I have been like, this is a ridiculous conceit, but I'm going to do it every single time anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hell yeah. But let's take a step into this time machine and mm -hmm. uh, go back. If there are some things that you would like to tell young writer Lillian uh, that you wish you had known then. Ooh. I, okay, I think the one that I have is no. This is this is gonna sound. I promise that this isn't me being mean to young writer Lillian. This is just like uh, you know, straight talk only in this room. Mm -hmm. um, nobody gives a shit about your creative output, but you. So mm -hmm. you might as well just do it. Um, any shame you have around not having written enough. Or any fear, fear that you have that other people are looking at you going like, look at them, they're not right. They're, they're not taking this seriously, not writing. It's fucking bullshit because everybody mm -hmm. is concerned primarily with their own creative output, just like you are the one primarily concerned with yours. And so I think what I would tell Lillian, um, Babby Lillian, would be fucking do it. Who gives a shit? Why not? Like, mm -hmm. why not? Like, there's, there's, I, uh, I don't. I don't respond so well to like pep talks because um, mm -hmm. my my problem is I, I'm I'm an ornery little bitch. Like when when people <laughs> try to pep talk me, my my instant knee jerk thing is just like don't fucking patronize me. Like I, I get mm -hmm. you know I, I I get sort of salty when people try to um, gas me up. But I think the thing that I I would respond to then and probably now is just like you might fuck it. You might as well write. Like there's. Mm -hmm. If if the thing stopping you from writing is the fact that you have not been writing and you feel bad about that, that's mm -hmm. not doing anybody any fucking favors. There is infinite time to write. Yeah. And, and you might as well do it. And and any You might as well any, fucking do it. You might as well fucking do it. Um there's no every pretty much every limitation is self-imposed. Like mm -hmm. you you know you you sort of think to yourself like oh god if only I, and and I mean I think there is a, a material you know thing there where like you know if you're if you're working a job that's particular or or several jobs or whatever that's like particularly strenuous obviously that's a huge drain on your time free time is limited but mm -hmm. I do feel like if you're gonna write you're gonna write like you're gonna mm -hmm. find the time to do that if it's what you really really want to do um, and I think yeah you might as well do it is the thing that I would tell young Lillian is just like. Stop being concerned that anybody's looking at you. Nobody gives a shit. You might yeah. as well write. Yeah. That is, I mean, it it comes back to... And it, it's so funny because this is so close to uh, what Haley Piper said on the last episode that will have just come out two weeks prior to this episode coming out, which I recorded yesterday. Time is fake. Nobody knows what's happening anyway. Mm -hmm. But it Dude, really Haley, is... Haley, Haley rules, by the way. Uh, they're th that I, I just read um, their short story collection. Like, she's so fucking good. Like, she's it is... so good. Yeah, yeah. The the uh, excerpt that she read from her new book uh, stomps ass. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's extremely thematically appropriate to what you read. Mm -hmm. uh, like, this is... This is just the month of queer body horror. Like, <laughs> this is our season. This is, this uh, is yeah, yeah. It is. Mm -hmm. Dare I say the season of the Vivitch? The the season of the Vivitch. Yeah, right there. Fucking beautifully illustrated. Yeah, it's um, it's right there. But it it really it comes down to just don't self reject. Yeah, like yeah. you're the, you're the person who's telling yourself not to do this thing. Like. Not everything's going to work. You can't know until you try. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's also the thing is it's um, a thing that I think is, is that, that that's good to figure out is it's like when you, um, in, in the before times when you might, you know, occasionally like go to a bar or a restaurant or something. Never heard um, of it. No, yeah, I, it's it's probably fake. Um, but so I'm a, a neurotic little, I, like I, I've... I've got really, really severe social anxiety. Um, and mm -hmm. so the thing that, you know, it used to be like I would, you know, walk into like a, a bar or a coffee shop or whatever and instantly have this fear of like, oh, God, I look like a, I look like a fucking homunculus. Like everybody's <laughs> everybody's judging my fucking shoes, my hair. Everybody knows 
I'm not, first of all, I'm not fucking cool. Second of all, like, you know, you're, you just, you sort of have this idea in your head of like, there's like a record scratch and everybody's looking over at you to judge mm-hmm. you. And the reality is no, it's really liberating. Nobody actually gives a shit about yeah. anybody else. Re- really? Like everybody's too busy worrying about people looking at them. Uh, and I think with, in the writing community especially, like, it can be really fucking intimidating when you come into it, and there's so mm-hmm. many talented people that are doing so much dope shit, and, you know, you sort of worry that, like, oh, man, if I'm over here writing my little stories, you know, they're, they're <laughs> you know, it's it's gonna, I'm gonna look like a fucking schmuck, and it's really just, like, no, there's infinite room, there's infinite room for stories, you might as well, fuck it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is, it is not a zero-sum game, despite how some whiny piss baby white boys would have you believe Mm -hmm. there is infinite space for infinite voices except Mm -hmm. if you're a fascist fuck you oh yeah yeah get fucked fuck your voice uh but yeah yeah, like there's no and and it's also the the good and the bad thing is that right now or not even the bad thing like a thing that i love is that there are so many indie presses out Mm -hmm. here doing it and there are so many places again uh, I, I want to stress, I was just on your lovely podcast doing my noir body horror cyberpunk uh, story. Yeah. And, you know, th- the thing is that there are fucking spaces that will do that, that, that mm-hmm. want to have your your weird little obsessions that has the space for you to get them out there. And so, uh, I don't know, I really, really love that, you know, because outside of the big five publishing mm-hmm. lines... If you want to find your specific tribe of fucking weirdos, there has just never been a better time yeah. to be getting there's into doing so this kind many. of genre. Yeah. Like, you, you imagine, you know, it's like you read in, there's, um, have you ever heard of uh, Trouble and Her Friends? I don't, it rings a bell, but I cannot bring it to mind. Yeah, I, I so I'm cyberpunk trash. Uh, I had never read this or heard of it until recently. It was from goddamn 1994. Um, and you know it's a queer cyberpunk story about this group of you know sort of queer hackers and uh it it our community has always been here and i think Mm -hmm. it's it's funny i think of um you know john darnell from the mountain goats Mm -hmm. um yeah he's yeah your your uncle john uh i i adore him and he yeah he's great uh and he has this thing that i really love which was you know he was pointing out that like people who complain that technology is making us more isolated was probably never isolated before like 1998 mm-hmm. like even even if it's you and some fucking uh chud on a film <laughs> message board arguing about alien versus predator or whatever <laughs> you're still able to communicate and connect with another human being like there's mm-hmm. i don't know i like not to get you know soppy or whatever but i I love that there are so many spaces for our specific kind of people to do what we do and to read the mm-hmm. kind of stories that we would never be fucking getting out of the big five. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for real. And, like, you know, to to plug something that, again, happened sometime in, in the last couple of years, I don't remember when, but, like, you know, you got to do your issue of Fireside Magazine and, like, yeah. The stories that you selected for that were, like, fucking incredible. And, like, I don't think people necessarily, you know, I, I don't know the history of all the stories that were submitted, but, like, I feel like some people sent you shit that they were like, holy shit, I want to send this specifically to Lillian. Like, Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's what I love is, like, so many of the things that we... I. I mean, not not to not to be mean. None of us are unique, really. Like we, mm-hmm. of course, we're unique. Like we have our own shit. But the stuff that we're into, I mean, there's always somebody else who's kind of into the same shit or is mm-hmm. is working the same beat. And yeah, I, honestly, doing that issue of Fireside was so great because it was it was really affirming. That, like, yes, the weird garbage I'm into. Yeah, it's you know, yeah. There's there's enough room in the garbage pile for all of us, and I think that's beautiful. there's. There is enough room in the garbage pile for all of us. Honestly, like, tattoo that across my heart. <laughs> yeah, so that's, yeah. But that's me being schmalty, you know? Like, yeah. I, I, it's, it, it, it makes, me, makes me feel good. Yeah. Uh, do you want to be schmaltzy about some other stuff? Because I've got some other stuff to be schmaltzy about. Oh, please, 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 by all means. Uh, can, can you be schmaltzy about 
rank and vile i know we've like basically just done an episode of it but like (laughs) and you know explained it to death but tell tell our listeners who maybe are just didn't know that they were listening waiting for a couple of Uh fucking garbage goblins to talk about every horror (laughs) movie tell us Mm -hmm. about it you know, you know what my favorite horror movie is? Every horror movie from the last. Um, uh, Rank and Vile, uh, we've been doing it since uh, 2016. Um, and we, god damn, it's been about five years. Uh, and we have been uh, ranking every single horror movie ever mm-hmm. made, which obviously is a completely insane conceit and can never totally happen. But, <laughs> you know, uh, at this point, I You're think doing we're doing your at, like, damnedest. I, you know what? We're fucking working the horror minds. Um, and we're, I think, 560 movies in. Uh, to to rank and vile and you know every episode we we talk about one or two movies um and then we rank them where you know well we started with like two movies which was like Bride of Frankenstein and now the screaming starts and mm-hmm. every episode we you know we try to figure out like okay so do we think that like Candyman two Furball to the flesh you know I feel like it's better than the Crow Wicked Prayer but not <laughs> as good as Brain Scan and then we talk about why um why we think that and also I want to point out it is total horseshit. Our <laughs> criteria for why we rank movies above other movies, it kind of just depends on how we feel that day. Um, periodically, Everything is when I'm subjective. Ranking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Periodically, like, we'll be ranking a movie and I'll be like, wait a minute, how the fuck is Videodrome at 183? <laughs> fuck. You know, like, it's... Uh, and it's just so much fun to, you know, figure out, like, why we like certain movies over other movies. And we sort of use criteria like um, the Friday night test, which is, like, if it's Friday night, you've got a Tombstone pizza, you've got a two liter of mug root beer. You know, mm-hmm. what's the... F- fun movie you're gonna put on like i love the movie audition very much but that's not like a a feel good no oh, that's not maybe, a... oh well i know actually i say that it kind of, it kind of is because my because my brain is broken and i've watched it so many times i'm like you know i just want to watch audition again um but yeah so it's it's a lot of fun um we yeah we're, we're pretty much everywhere you you would want to download uh podcasts yeah. and um uh, we're on Letterboxd. I'm also about to start doing um, Twitch streams of playing old SNES era horror video games because, like, I got Fantastic. I've been playing I've been playing Zombies Ate My Neighbor um, Neighbors oh, li- yes. lately, and was just kind of like, what if I babbled over the top of this and somebody could dissociate to it for a while on the internet? So I yeah. would dissociate to that. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm. That's all I want is to dissociate. Uh, yeah, but yeah, that's that's pretty much yeah. That's what that's where that's where it's at. Fantastic, and. What have you been getting into, ghoul shit wise or otherwise, that you just really want to gush about? <sighs> ghoul shit wise or otherwise, um, I have been uh, learning how to play hair metal guitar solos. So the thing Fantastic. is, like, I've been so like I've been you know like I'm a huge, which honestly was such a, an early gender moment for me of mm-hmm. you know being like a, a little trans egg who was like it's so weird I'm like super into all these hair metal bands and they've all got this like ratted hair and this makeup and you know like like a, like a bunch of manly fellows you know mm-hmm. like you yeah um and Just a, you know a I, bunch of dudes being bros yeah yeah and so I I've I, I've been playing guitar for like twenty years but. Um, I've always been sort of a, a forlorn plunker, as uh-huh. my 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 dad would would call it, because um, you know, and I've I've just been going through like I'm gonna play the solo from Dream Warriors by Dawkins, and then very quickly realizing like, oh, George Lynch, real good at play guitar. I not yeah. so good. Um, so I've just been like practicing so much fucking guitar lately, and especially in quarantine, um, I think it's been a really uh, good thing to have a thing to do. Because mm-hmm. otherwise, I've been I've been going a little bit crazy. Like I don't know. It's like right now I'm trying to, um, without going into it too much. I just quit drinking, uh, and so trying to. It's like the the bag of sand and the monkey statue from Indiana Jones, mm-hmm. right? Where it's like I'm trying to replace this with other things quickly uh-huh. enough that the bold, that the boulder doesn't fucking crush me. Um, so yeah. that's mostly that's mostly been uh, DDP yoga and guitar solos, which is. I think about as manly as I get. Fantastic. Look, we love to see it. Yeah, what what about what about you? What's what's the what's the goal shit you've been uh, constant? So I got the uh the complete Earth Sea that's illustrated by Charles Vess for Christmas, which Ooh. is like a fucking honker of a book. Hell yeah. Oh uh, and I am almost finished with the farthest shore, which is 
I think maybe only the second time I've ever read it. Like, I adore A Wizard of Earthsea and The Tombs of Atuan. I've read each of them, like, a dozen times each. Yeah. And then I just, like, was either not in the mood for it when I had access to the other books or didn't just didn't have access to all of the other Earthsea stories. Mm -hmm. And so right now I'm just like, yeah, I'm going to read all the fucking Earthsea books. Yeah, uh, fuck yeah. And, you know, and plus with Charles Vess's amazing illustrations on top of them, like, I I adore, you know, if, I, if I'm just going to read an Earthsea, I'm going to mm -hmm. probably take my, like, tattered ass bantam books copy <laughs> of a wizard of earth sea with mm -hmm. the uh woodcut chapter header illustrations oh yeah See, uh, I, I i love earth sea because like as i, I i'm i'm an anarchist and like ursula k Le Guin is like a real freak when it comes yeah. to like just sort of being like anarchist leanings like it's I, I love how many small babies got introduced to anarchist ideology just from ursula, ursula k Le Guin just being like hey kids you know it's not great the government <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's yeah it's extremely good yeah uh so i've been i've been getting into that and then i'm also like so one of my like extremely goblin hobbies is building mm -hmm. uh mechanical keyboards which i got Holy into shit. like i don't know probably four five years ago now when it was still like I mean, it, it is an extremely niche hobby among niche hobbies anyway, but Hillary, there was like so, so cool. little. That is so fucking cool. I, I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've ever known anybody who does that. That's, that's yeah. amazing. It, it's so much fun, but I just got into, uh, there's a, uh, a dude who made his own endgame keyboard and decided that in designing it, he was going to write a scripting language to allow other people to programmatically generate keyboards. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking for a while, like, you know, I really, uh, my my main board for three, four years now has been the Kibio Iris, which is a fantastic keyboard. I'll have a picture of it in the, uh, in the show notes. Uh, mm -hmm. Pull it up here right now. It's this sort of... Uh, like Whoa. split uh speaking of fucking shaped... cyberpunk yeah uh it, it's got Joseph. rainbow lights on it it's uh you know it, it's honestly my favorite thing to type on i've i've used a couple of other split ergonomic keyboards in the past and i just keep coming back to this one but it's mm. also just like not quite perfect and mm. this you got a tinker yeah, this guy uh, who's, I think, Mr. Zealot on GitHub. I'll have links in the show notes for anybody who's my specific brand of trash. Uh, mm -hmm. Wrote this tool called Ergogen, which just lets you define a keyboard in a JSON file. And then it'll spit out profiles. It'll spit out a uh, layout. It'll even spit out uh, a whole fucking PCB file for you. Holy shit. And so I'm, like, working on uh, a new keyboard in there, mostly because I got a new laptop some months ago now and realized that I don't like typing on regular people keyboards anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, at this point, like, your your brain is just like, this is, uh, yeah, uh, long live the new flesh. Like, this, you've, 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 you can't go back again. Yeah. Because now you know. Because now if, you know if I like. could do that bullshit from uh, from oh cyberpunk anime Ghost in the Shell, where oh, your yeah. fingers split open and turn into a million fingers, mm -hmm. like oh, if I could, yeah, that's what you want. That'd be great, but I can't, yeah. and so you know I'm trapped in this meat flesh where like <laughs> a standard QWERTY keyboard just fucking doesn't work for me anymore doesn't i need to have everything under my thumbs and not just a space bar that's <laughs> some normie shit and i'm not here for it anymore no you've 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 grown beyond uh yeah absolutely that i'm so i'm so pleased <laughs> about this journey for you of just like eventually it's gonna be you're gonna look like fucking data from next gen like it's yes. just gonna be with the yeah the big fingers 
it's yeah, I'm love this. Yeah, love so this I've one. I've got I ordered some like a pack of mystery switches because I was like I don't want to spend like real money on it and I don't want to spend my good switches on it. Right. I'm just gonna get some random switches and ended up getting <laughs> like I I haven't typed with them yet, but they feel real good. Oh, uh, I mean for yeah. For the one other listener out there who was like, what switches did you fucking get? Uh, I got uh, Hacko Royal True, which are a tactile switch. They have a like nice heavy spring on them, and they like have oh, a really nice tactile feel. Uh, nice. And so yeah, I'm I'm working on my second revision of this keyboard and then mm. I'll probably print out some cases and and actually like test like oh is this actually doing the thing I want it to do before I get into everything else you're making me like uh, reconsider my my keyboard position because normally I was like well yeah you know I like my little keyboard but now I'm like what if I could go deeper and I've got these like yeah yeah Lillian you should go Not deeper yet. you should absolutely <laughs> go deeper you should get Sounds into some weird. absolute ghoul shit keyboard yeah this is this is on some hellraiser shit is what this is like this is you know just you have to you solve the box and next thing you know you've got like five hands and six keyboards this is this is how it happens it's how it happens it's the thing you want uh and so everybody should get into mechanical keyboards that's Mm -hmm. that's the that's the new tagline of this show everyone should get (laughs) into mechanical keyboards do it you cowards yeah yeah lily it's been absolutely the best unmitigated ghoul shit having you on thank you so much for coming on the show thank you for having me on thank you for letting me read the start of my upcoming uh cyberpunk noir body horror novella hell yeah Um, yeah it was it always always a fucking delight thank you so much uh before we get going i just realized i didn't ask where can our listeners find you because they definitely do want to find you Oh God! Uh, I am uh, permanently and abidingly shit posting on Twitter at here lies Lil, um, L I L L, um, all one word. Uh, I guess of course all one word. You can't do fucking spaces. Yeah. Uh, my yeah, my website is yarnbody.net. Um, if you you know if you if you need some editing or you need a podcast theme or you need you definitely need a podcast theme. Oh yeah, yeah. L- listen, I'll, I'll 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 make you a podcast name. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's uh, that's pretty much where I'm at. Um, I'm also on Reedsy at uh, reedsycom slash Lillian dash Boyd. Um, so yeah, get at me. Fantastic. It's been again such a pleasure. Listeners, stick around next month when our guests will be Emmy Mears and Andy Buchanan. Uh, it's yes. going to be so much fun. Tales from the Trunk is mixed and produced in beautiful Oakland, California. I've been waiting this f- for this for a while. Take it away, <laughs> Lily. Uh, the theme music is uh, Paper Wings by Lillian Boyd. And that's yeah. the, the theme. That, uh, uh, Lily, uh, Lillian Boyd made that theme. That's the theme that I made. I made yeah. It. You made it. Yeah. Hell yeah, I did that. Hell yeah. <laughs> you can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash trunkcast. All patrons of the show now get a sticker and logo button, along with show outtakes and other content that can't be found anywhere else. You can find the show on Twitter, at trunkcast, and I tweet at hvbisniex. If you like the show, consider taking a moment to rate and review us on your preferred podcast platform. And remember, don't self-reject. (laughs) 